Anytime the Lord rescues someone from death to life, it's a miracle. And in fact, that's actually the theme of this message this morning. But before I get into that, I just want to welcome all those who are visiting. I am so glad you're here. I said that last night. It's still true today. And we are just enthusiastic to be able to impart anything we can. And a microphone. And <clears throat> into your lives. And, and that's our joy. And our hope is that you just come out of this time so enriched and so furthered in your walk and love for the Lord. He can do much in a little to that very end. All right. This is great. I like it. See, now you see the real TMU. We have nothing to hide. And for those of you who aren't visiting, but you're my students, I always say it over and over, and I mean it. You are, you are our crown and joy, but you are definitely mine. Uh, every time I have an opportunity with you all, it's just a blessing and I think absence sometimes makes the heart grow fonder and sometimes matters take me away. That Even microphones can do that. <clears throat> and that's fine. Okay, cool. All right. I don't know which one I'm actually using right now, but <laughs> I've got two, so this is good. No. Joyful for you. You guys are such an encouragement to my own soul. Time that I interact with you and we spend time together, the Lord uses it to just sanctify and strengthen my own resolve. So I constantly give thanks to the Lord for you, constantly. Um, it's just whenever I think of you all, my heart immediately has joy, just immediately has joy. Well, like I said, the topic for this morning is talking about the miracle of death to life, as was just mentioned, and this has weighed so heavily on my heart. I remember writing part of a commentary on the passage that I'm going to speak on uh, over a year ago, sitting back in my chair and just praising God and being an absolute wonder over the truths expressed here, and that truth and that moment has still captured me a year later to this very day, and that is my heart for you this morning as you are my crown and joy. And so will you join me in a word of prayer because we really need the Lord to bless this time. Our God and Father, we are desperate. We are desperate to know the glories of your grace. We are desperate to be renewed in our mind of the wonder of for salvation and of the truth. And we ask now that you would engage everything in our mind, everything in our soul. We would understand the desperate straits we were in and, and the nature of death and understand the heights of grace and the power of the resurrection. May, may these truths instill in us and compel us to have a true wonder, a true absolute astonishment that we should be dead but we're alive. And that is because of nothing short of a miracle of what the Lord Jesus Christ has accomplished on our behalf. Thank you. Thank you for sending him before us. Thank you for him coming before us and breaking through death. Thank you. And all that it reflects about your relentless love as the impossible. Thank you for all these things. And even an earnestness, an desire to go deep, richly into these truths, all for your glory, in which we pray. Amen. Not long ago, I believe it was even last Sunday, it was Resurrection Sunday, and I trust that you had a wonderful day renewing your mind in that essential truth, that message that explores the depths and the heights of the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ, his breaking through of death into new life. And it is in 
indicative of the Christian faith that we would have a day where we remember that, even as we remember it constantly, because the truth of the resurrection, as you know, is so vital. Paul recalls that if the resurrection it didn't occur, that we are the most to be pitied, our faith is absolutely pointless, and our message is in vain. We know that the resurrection matters. But here's what's astonishing in light of that. If you really think about Easter or Resurrection Sunday and you compare it to everything else that's happening, not only in our culture, but specifically in Christian culture, you might say that Resurrection Sunday is really underplayed. For as vital as that truth is, it's ignored. There's far more preparation. There's far more celebration. There's far more anticipation. There's far more excitement, both in our culture and in our Christian culture specifically, about Christmas and even Thanksgiving than Easter. If you think about it then, what does that reflect about ourselves? That while we say, yes, the resurrection matters, we actually cherish sentimentality and materialism over Christ. What the Bible says is most important. We say that all the time. It's important. But we show that other things matter a whole lot more. And it has gotten to the point where sometimes when people are asked, what's the gospel? We often just say this. Oh, it's that Jesus died for me. He died for our sins. That's it. He, he died for us. He was on the cross. That's the gospel. And we've forgotten the entire other side of the equation, which is absolutely necessary, without which we are the most to be pitied. It wasn't just that he died. It was that he also what? Rose. How is it that we can so easily forget the most important part of the message? If it's so vital, if we confess and say, this is what matters, this is so important, this is absolutely necessary and essential, then why do we keep forgetting it? And why is it that we celebrate everything else more? And why is it that we prepare for everything else with a lot more gusto and a lot more enthusiasm than the one thing that really, really matters according to the scripture? Why is that? We keep saying that the resurrection matters but for some reason, it doesn't seem like we really believe that. And so what we need to do is recover the doctrine of the resurrection. And we need to get our arms around why this matters so much. Why is this so important? And if we're answering that question of why it's so important, immediately we start to realize this doctrine is big. If we're trying to get our arms around it, what we'll soon realize is, it's very hard to do that because it is so massive. And every single detail of the resurrection is astounding, precise, theologically rich, and epic. Let me give you an example. Why did Jesus rise on Sunday? Why did he rise on the first day? In fact, in the Greek text over and over again, it says the first day of the week. The first day of the week. It doesn't just say the first day. It emphasizes the first day of the week. Here's a question for you. Where does... Where else in the Bible? And just trace in your mind, starting from Genesis, where does it talk about a week? Genesis chapter 1, creation. The resurrection is so massive. And the reason that God puts it on Sunday, the first day of the week, is that the resurrection is so powerful, it starts a new reality of history. You had old creation and history of the world and the old world in Genesis 1. And in Luke 24 or Matthew 28 and others, you have a new era, a new epoch of history. That's how massive the resurrection is. And what drives this new era of history? Well, if you read any resurrection account in the Gospels, it always emphasizes the very moment the light broke through. What was created on the first day? God said, let there be what? Light. Now you have a new light. Now you have the most brilliant light. The light that breaks through the darkness is exactly what Isaiah 8 says. Those in darkness have seen a great light because the light of Christ has broken through sin. 
because the light of Christ has broken through Satan and death. That's what happened. Everything starts to turn around. And if you really want to understand why this is a new era of history and a new dawn for the entire world and the flow of God's redemptive plan, you could illustrate it this way. The women, as Luke reminds us, they went to the tomb and they did not find Jesus' body there. That's indicative of a whole new way of life. And let me just illustrate it this way. The word for tomb is actually the word memory. I don't know if you knew that, but it's the word memory. It's the word remembrance. Because that's what a tomb is, if you stop and think about it. That's where you go to remember the past, your time with loved ones in the past. That's what a tomb does. That's what a grave marker does. And so the way life worked up until the resurrection, in a sense, was this. You live, and then you're dead, and all you have is the what? The past. All you have are the memories. That's all that there is. That's how this world operates. That's what we are used to. That's the paradigm of the unbelieving pagan mind. Absolutely. But here's what they found. Or shall we say, here's what they didn't find in Luke 24. They didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. Why? Because a tomb is no longer just where you remember the past. There's no body there because it's not just about the past anymore. It's about the what? The future. It's about the future. It's no longer that you live and then you die and all you have is the past and there really is no future for you. Now what it is is you die and you live and all you have is a what? A future. The Lord's resurrection is so powerful, it changes the very way this world operates, the very way life operates, the very way that the eternal destiny of saints will operate. It's no longer you live and you die. You die and you live. The system has been completely reset. The system has been reversed, and there is hope. And yes, that could be another thing to talk about. Yeah, the resurrection is epic. Even the date of it is epic, and the details of it are epic, but they give hope, and they give hope on a personal level. We'll talk more about that in a second, but they give hope even on a global level. Have you ever wondered why Jesus said that he was going to rise on the third day? Yes? Third day. Why three? Why not six? Why not seven? Seven's a biblical number. You could do 40. That's a biblical number. You could do 144,000. That would be a little bit hard to count, but you could do it. That would be spectacular. Why three? Just because we're not good at math and we all need to go to the master's university? Okay. No, it's this. In Hosea 6, God says about Israel, I will raise you on the third day. I will raise you on the third day. And when Jesus rose from the third day, what he secured was the promise that not only for individuals, but even for the elect of Israel, that he would raise up that entire nation. In the book of Daniel, chapter 12, Daniel has always been in the minority. Have you noticed that? He's always stood alone. Maybe he's got three friends with him. Great. Four people versus the world. He's always been the minority. And while we think that might be heroic, you know, for Daniel, that was lonely. That was tough. And you know what? At the end of Daniel's life, right before he's probably going to die, why? Because he's like 90 at this point in Daniel 12, so it's not that many more years. You know what God says to him? He says, Daniel, let me tell you, let me tell you a secret. At the end of your days, at the end of all time, there will be many raised. Daniel, you've always been by yourself. You've always been the one who's wondered, am I the only faithful one left? You've, only, you've always only had maybe three friends, but infinite enemies. But I'm here to tell you, God says in Daniel chapter 12, there will be not a few, but what? Many raised. And on the last day, here's what Daniel will see. Every generation of Israelite who loved the Lord God from every single time period resurrected and then he will know I was never alone. That's the power and the hope 
of the resurrection. It's not just for you and me personally. Amen, it's that. More on that in a second. But it even established not only history, but establishes the world. And it's not just establishing history in the world. It is historical. Why do you have a bodily, physical resurrection? That's what we emphasize, that the resurrection isn't just a nice metaphor. It's not just a nice concept. No, it is physical and bodily and historical in that way. Why do we emphasize that? Because what God has redeemed and what God has resurrected, he can make right. He can make right. You wonder, all the problems in this world... All the problems that are physically and tangibly present, starvation and hurt and hunger and war and death, can he make that right? And here's what the bodily, physical resurrection of Christ says. He did. And he will. Because he did. He will. The resurrection in that way is part of the solution to the problem of evil. Because the problem of evil wonders, can God actually handle evil? And what does the resurrection prove? Evil will not win on any front. It won't win on the spiritual level. It won't win on the supernatural level. And it won't win on the natural level. Christ has and will conquer all. God will leave no territory of his unchecked. He will leave no territory of his unclaimed for his glory. All creation, every molecule of it in the end, natural and supernatural, will be his. And that's the glory of the resurrection. The resurrection is massive to think about. It's what changes history. It's what changes the system of this world. It's what sets hope for nations. It's what solves the problem of evil. This is big. And for some of us here, we're thinking, that, that's amazing. It's hard to get my arms around it. But, but maybe I could, could we just start a little bit smaller? Instead of problem of evil and history and epic and life and philosophy and theology, How about just to me, just for me personally? Could we just start there? I'm with you. And there's a passage for that. There's a passage for everything. And it's in Jonah chapter 2. Turn there with me. Jonah 2, 5 and 6. 5 and 6. And Jonah's message is this. And I'm going to give you the punchline now. And you've really got to think about it. And my prayer and my plea is for you to go in depth within it. Here's the punchline. You and I, you and I, we should be dead. We should be dead. And that should be a certain way. And that should be what we always have had. We should have never even taken a breath. But we're alive. And that's the power of the resurrection. You and I, and you've got to know this, and you've got to go deep into it. You and I, for sure, for sure, should be dead. We should have died. But we're alive. And we even have life abundantly. And that's only because of the resurrection. And if you can grasp that sense then you understand the power of Christ's resurrection, not necessarily just for history or nations or or world or the problem of evil. You understand the power of that for you. And that's what we're going to be covering this morning. You could put it this way. The only reason you're not dead is because of a miracle. The impossible And that's the resurrection. And so with that, turn with me to Jonah. It sounds like you're already there. And as we get into it, there is some context necessary because we got to get to know Jonah. And we got to understand what Jonah 2 is doing here. And we are familiar with Jonah because he's such a disobedient prophet. The guy is just crazy in his disobedience to the Lord. God says, go to Nineveh. And so Jonah goes to Tarshish. 
The guy just has a, you know, he's not just directionally challenged, he's, he's disobedient. And in fact, there's lots of things that he does to disobey the Lord. It says that Jonah went down. It repeats that over and over. He went down to Joppa, and then he went down into a boat, and then he went down into the bowels of a boat. He's going down, 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 down. You'll need to know that for later. But it illustrates his pervasive sinfulness. Speaking of boats and sinfulness, he Actually, in the Hebrew, it says that he paid its fare, not his fare for the boat, but its fare. The idea most likely is that Jonah, in his desperation to run from the presence of God and keep going down away from heaven, so to speak, in his own twisted and perverted mind that he could escape the Lord, he actually bought the entire boat to do it. People are like, where's this boat going? Tarshish, do you have room for passengers? We're a cargo ship. That's why we have stuff on the boat. I'll buy the boat. All that to disobey God. He sunk his life savings to not go to Nineveh. Think about that. And Israelites, they're boat phobic. They don't like boats. There's a lot of passages in the Old Testament where you realize Israel is not a maritime nation. Never have been. Doesn't do it. And so this guy conquers phobia, lands his life savings, all to disobey God. It's astounding to think about the rebelliousness of this individual. And the prophet is very foolish. And what is absolutely hilarious is what God does through all of this saga. You see, Jonah didn't want to go to the Gentiles. He didn't want them to repent. So what ends up happening? He gets on a boat. And guess what they do on the boat? They repent. All these Gentiles. He's like, no repentance for you. And they all start repenting. It's crazy. And then... And then what does God do? He sticks them in a fish. Why does he stick them in the fish? Because the Ninevites worship the fish god. And so now the fish just spews them out. And all the Ninevites, when they see Jonah, they're saying, you're sent by the fish? Then we're going to listen to you. We're going to repent. Totally counterproductive. He did everything he could to prevent the Ninevites of repenting. And he realized in the end, by doing that, he actually did everything he could to have them repent. (laughs) The guy's crazy. And then on top of that, he walks in the city He doesn't even speak in complete sentences. He's so mad. He's like, 40 days, dead. And then all of a sudden, the whole city, he hasn't even gotten through the three-day walk through the city. He just lands the first day, and the whole city has a massive revival right in front of his eyes. (laughs) The guy is a repentance magnet. It's just crazy. He can't win. And God disciplined him in that way. You know, the word Jonah... (coughs) It means dove. And you say, why? Well, doves, you know, they can be associated with the Holy Spirit and stuff, and they have a noble purpose in that way, even a sacrificial purpose. But there is another usage of the word dove in Scripture, and it's for dumb people. (laughs) Jonah is dumb. His name means I'm dumb. (laughs) And he certainly lives up to his name. And here's the question. Why... Did Jonah do what he did? And you might say, well, because he was prejudiced. He didn't like the Gentiles, and that's true. But can we get into some deeper heart issues? And if you do, you start to realize, well, maybe in part it's because he he rejected God's omnipresence, even though the scriptures, like Psalm 139, are absolutely clear that, hey, you cannot escape from God's presence. You cannot go to the depths of the sea. God is still there, even though it is emphatically explicit that that is the case. Jonah still does it anyway. He suppresses the attributes of God. And why does he do that? Well, it kind of makes sense. If you don't like the Gentiles, then you don't, you're going to eventually try to suppress anything that would indicate that God's loving kindness could actually extend there because of his omnipresence. That makes sense. But it goes deeper than that. What was Jonah's problem? Jonah's problem is that he didn't understand God's grace. That was his real problem. In fact, he explicitly says that in Jonah chapter 4. I knew you were a God, he says to God. That was slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. What a problem. But for Jonah it was. Because he didn't understand loving kindness. He didn't understand that he was so undeserving of God's grace. And when you don't understand how undeserving you are, all of a sudden you start to think, oh, I'm better than that person. I'm better than that person. They don't deserve it. They shouldn't have it. And the reason you feel like people shouldn't have it, they shouldn't have it, is because you're so much better than them. 
And likewise, when you suppress the grace of God and you misunderstand it and you lessen his grace from the divine side, what is so overwhelmingly good, so good it compels you to share it because it just can't be contained, now just becomes mostly good. And you hoard it. It's Gollum, my precious. That's Jonah. Jonah's Gollum and a dove, all in one. <laughs> Jonah lessened God's grace, so he hoarded it all to himself. And he felt like he deserved it over those yucky Gentiles. And therefore, they shouldn't get it. And all of that drove everything in his heart and all of this insane disobedience that he had in the book of Jonah. And so what does God do to Jonah? He throws him in the ocean to teach him about grace. He puts him in a near-death situation, and perhaps many of us here have been there. Many of you have had a near-death experience. In fact, Jonah, as we will see shortly, wants us to recall that. One time, I remember talking with an individual in Israel, and he said this, that he was riding the bus, and he got off at his normal bus stop, and then one bus stop later, the bus exploded. He was the only one who got off that bus. That's near death. That's near death. He should have died, but he survived. It's amazing. I remember one time for myself, I was driving on the 210 freeway, and there's this point where the 210 merges with the 5, and any of these mergers are just really crazy. And you're in California, which is crazy. I shouldn't probably be sharing this on a view weekend. California's safe. It's a great place. Come here. <laughs> but, but this can happen anywhere. And, and as we were trying to move over lanes, a car hit me, and I started spinning on the freeway. And I just remember thinking two thoughts. One was, how am I going to stop this? I, I'm not James Bond. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and then the second thought was this. I'm dead. There's, we're in the middle of California traffic. It's night. They can't see me. There's semis on this. There, there's no way I, anyone can stop. I just wonder what it's going to be like. That's it. It's over. And all of a sudden, as my car spun out in the middle of the highway, I got out. The other guy got out. And he's like, my bad. And then he left. <laughs> uh, that was great. And, uh, and I just turned around, and the entire freeway had stopped. I couldn't believe it. It was just a wall of cars. And they just all stopped there. And people got out of the car, and they're like, you OK? You OK? And I'm like, this is weird. <laughs> I'm like, we could just have a service right now. <laughs> I got in the car and drove back to my apartment and just realized I should have been dead. I should have died, but I'm alive. You have, or you will have those moments. Jonah had it, Jonah had it, and he reflected on it just like you would. You need to remember this for this message, those kind of moments, that is. And upon reflecting upon it, he, he engaged us all to understand the nature of God's grace, the nature of God's grace. That's what we have here. Sometimes people say, well, is Jonah's repentance here valid because he kind of just deviates at the very end? Here's a simple response to that. This is the bare minimum of what you have to have. This is the starting point. This isn't the end. This is the bare minimum. If you don't have this, you don't get it. That's the point. So let's get the bare minimum. You and I, we should be dead, but we're not. And there are two points in Jonah 5 and 6 which help us to understand the depth and the height of God's grace. And here's the first one, the desperation of death. The desperation of death. And we see this in actually the most part of verses 5 and 6. Jonah is writing poetry at this moment, deep reflection. And with poetry, one of its features is that it invites you to meditate with Jonah. It invites you into the experience. And so 
just remember the times where your life has been on the line and kind of make analogy here. And Jonah describes, you know what death feels like? You want to understand the nature of death to really taste grace? Well, let me give you five quick descriptions of it. Here's the first one. It's choking. It's a sensation of choking. Look at the beginning of verse 5. Then the water engulfed into my very soul. The word engulf means to surround. The word engulf means that you're wrapped up or tied up. It's used often as a key word in the psalm. Psalm 1 16 is a good example. And Psalm 18 verse 5, the cords of death wrapped around me. And 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 that is an inherently mortal and deadly. But this is more than that because those cords, they wrap out outside of you. What does the text say about Jonah's experience? The water engulfed him into his what? His soul. It wasn't on the outside. It was on the what? The inside. It was filling his lungs. It was choking out and snuffing out his life. Have you ever choked before for real? Where you're wheezing and gasping for air. Have you ever been in a swimming pool and you've just accidentally, hopefully not on purpose, accidentally just breathed in a ton of water and you're just suffocating under that? It's near asphyxiation. That's the sensation. You know, it's a powerful, powerful burning and physical trauma that happens when you have this experience. One time I was in a children's hospital and I was visiting a uh, young daughter of one of our congregants, and she was struggling to breathe, and she would cough so hard that her oxygen, her O2 levels would drop dramatically. And so they had her on this machine, and I just watched her cough, and her whole body shook as she struggled to get the next breath. It broke your heart, but that's how hard a body fights to breathe. That's how hard a body fights to breathe. There's a reason why Cultures of all times have used water to torture people because they know that's the fastest way to break you. Here's what Jonah said. I was broken. I'm choking. Imagine the desperation. You're trying to get your next breath, but all the air is being sucked out of your lungs, filled with water in their place, and you're gasping for breath, and you can't get the next one, and everything's fading to black because your life is being taken away from your eyes. That moment, you're struggling the hardest, and that moment, you're the most helpless and desperate. That's death. Brothers and sisters, when the Bible speaks of death, it isn't just talking about the moment, the quantitative moment, the soul leaves the body. It's talking about the dying. You want to know what eternal death is? It isn't just annihilationism. It isn't that at all. What it is, it's not the quantity of death. It's the quality. You know what hell is like? It's like choking out in your lungs and you never can stop. Imagine that. And Jonah says, that's how I felt. It wasn't just that he was choking. Notice the next phrase. He was confused, totally confused, to put it mildly. It says this, that the depths surrounded me. And you might think, well, no kidding, Jonah. Obviously, it's, you're in the water. What else do you expect? No, 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 no. Understand this. The depths refer to the deepest part of the ocean where you're completely surrounded by darkness, where you're completely surrounded by water until the point you don't know up, down, left, right, or anything. In fact, I was reading online about some divers and such, and they said they needed instruments when they got to a certain depth because they could actually inadvertently dive deeper thinking that they're going to the surface because they can't see any light. And if you think, is that really possible? In God's providence, I had a conversation with one of my children that actually illustrated this. And we were talking about cruise ships and stuff. And, and she said, you know what's terrifying about a cruise? And I said, what? And she said, imagine you're in the ocean and you don't know where the land is. And you're just looking out there. Is it that way? Is it that way? Is it that way? Is it that way? Maybe. Have no idea. Without instrumentation, you are totally lost. That's 2D, now just do it 3D, and you've got Jonah. You've got Jonah, and you're like, great, Chow. Now you've just ruined everything about water, like choking on it, uh, cruises and boats, it's all gone. This is why we have TMU swim team. <laughs> Jonah 2, why lifeguards matter. Jonah 
at this moment doesn't just feel like he's choking out, he's totally lost. Everyone fears being lost. Everyone fears the sense that they don't know where they're going and they can't escape. That's why GPSs were invented. And that's why they sell. Because everyone has that fear. In fact, have you ever had a nightmare where you just keep trying to find a place and find a place and find a place and you can't find it and you're just circling around in rooms? Do you want to see how somebody is completely demoralized? Watch a hiker realize that he's been to the same spot over and over and over again and doesn't know his way out. They just sit down and give up. It's crazy. The fear of being lost is debilitating. And Jonah said, in that moment, I was confused. I didn't know up, down, left, or right. That's what I felt. It wasn't just that he was choking. It wasn't just that he was confused. It's that he was confined. Notice the next verse. It says this, that, or the end of verse 5, rather, that the, that the reeds wrapped around my head. The idea of wrapping something is to bind it tight. If you're claustrophobic, that's already triggered here. But even more than that, when the reeds are wrapped so tightly around Jonah, what he starts to understand is you're chained. There's no getting back. Do you want to know how to completely destroy somebody, take away their hope? And when Jonah is chained by the reeds to the ocean, he knows there's no hope for him. And so he's immersed in this choking sensation. He's immersed in feeling lost and panicked and confused. He's immersed in feeling absolutely confined and trapped. There is no escape for him. There is no way out. And all of this compounds to this moment where he understands, I'm condemned. I'm condemned. Notice the beginning of verse 6. It says this, I went down to the bottom of the mountains, to the base of the mountains. Did you hear that word, went down? What did Jonah do for most of his time in Jonah 1? He went down. He went down to Joppa, verse 5. He went down into the boat. He went down into the bowels of the ship. And now what does he confess in Jonah 2? I'm going down more. What did Jonah realize? I got exactly what I deserved. Even more, he realized this. I got what I wanted. Part of the justice of hell, part of it, not the whole, is that everyone in hell gets exactly what they want, only to find out that they never really wanted it. That's the tragedy of hell. Jonah says, I went down to the base of the mountains. I wanted to escape from God. I wanted to get rid of his presence. I wanted to flee from his, his essence. And now what happens is that I, in a sense, have been cast out from him. I'm at the base of the mountains and there's nothing left for me. And what he realized is all of this choking and all of this confinement and all of this confusion, it's not by accident. It's because God is disciplining him. It is because God has punished him. And he knows because of that. He knows because this is not accident, but God's sovereign hand. This is what you deserve. And there really isn't. And there shouldn't be a court of appeal because that's exhausted. God has already evidently made his verdict. And so there's nothing you can do. This is all your fault. And guess what? You should just accept it. You should just accept it. And so choking and confusion and containment and confinement and con condemnation all reach a final conclusion, and that is exactly it. This is conclusive. Notice what it says in the rest of verse 6. It says that the bars of the earth closed around me forever. Forever. Here's what Jonah started to realize. This is what I deserve. This sensation of choking, the sensation of total confusion and lostness, the panic and terror that that brings, this idea that I have no hope, that that should be, by God's condemnation, my status for forever. I'm locked in this prison of Sheol, so to speak. I'm locked in this prison, and what I experienced on this side of eternity should be what I have on the other side of eternity. That's what I should have, because I should be locked down here. That's what Jonah felt. Jonah felt the choking. Jonah felt the confusion. Jonah felt the confinement. Jonah felt the condemnation. And he understood that that should be the conclusion. 
That should be the conclusion. Even though Jonah technically, he didn't feel this for very long. You might think like, this sounds like it was like hours. Dude, if it was hours, he's dead. For real. No, this was seconds. This was a minute. Because then you have Mr. Big Fish that eats him. It's fine. But this is what he felt like in that moment. And he could barely handle it. Imagine what it is for eternity, for real. And you might say, well, man, I'm glad I'm not Jonah. This doesn't apply to me. It's just about him. No, Jonah worded this in a way that applies to every single person. He's quoting Psalms. I mentioned Psalm 18, Psalm 116. They're all quoted here. Psalm 69 is quoted here. Why? Because Jonah is saying, this isn't just about my experience. This is what David experienced, and it isn't just what David experienced. In fact, David is quoting from his own personal journals, shall we say, in the book of 2 Samuel, but he's reworded that to put it in the Psalms so that it's indicative and inclusive of everybody. It has that universality to it. David and Jonah's point is this, everyone in one way or another will experience this. Everyone one way or another has experienced this, whether it be metaphorically like David, physically like Jonah, or by analogy like us, there is a way that you've experienced these kind of sensations. And everyone, let's be clear, and this is their point too, deserves something like this, not just in your life, but for forever. And this, then, is the thought exercise. What God did and what Jonah understood is that God designed his discipline to give him a taste of what life is without grace. To give him a taste of what life is without grace. So here's the thought exercise. Do it with me right now. Imagine, imagine choking gasping for breath, and you're trying to breathe, and your life is being suffocated out, but it never is. You just are perpetually in that state. Imagine, imagine that you're trapped, and you're lost, and you're trying to find your way out at the same time, and you, you can't, and you're panicking, and you're fearful, and it never ends. Imagine if you are totally constrained, and you have no hope, and imagine if all you knew for certain is that this would be your existence forever unceasing. This is the nightmare that never ends. Imagine that. Think about that hard. And then imagine that you woke up. Imagine that you survived. First thing you do is you breathe a sigh of what? Relief. And you sit in your, up in bed or you sit in a chair you say, man, I need to decompress a little bit. I just can't believe that. And you're in wonder. You're in amazement. You're just astounded. That feeling right there. That feeling right there. That's the bare minimum joy of the doctrine of the resurrection. Because here's what Jonah is reminding us. You and I, we should be dead. That, what he just described, that only took place for a couple seconds, that should be your entire unceasing existence. That's all you should have ever known. But it's not. Because someone rescued you out. You should have died. But you're alive. And that, my friends, is the glory of the resurrection. If you don't understand the resurrection... A problem is, is that you don't understand the desperation of death. It's not just the moment your soul departs from your body. The reason the Bible calls the second death the second death, it's the dying without death. That's what it is. It's eternal dying without death. And that's what you and I should have had were it not for grace, were it not for the resurrection. That's the sweetness of it all. Well, at the same time, at the same time, it's not just that we were delivered from something. Jonah and all of us are delivered to something. And this brings us to the second point. It's not just the desperation of death. At the end of verse 6, what we have is the drama of deliverance. The drama of deliverance. Notice the last phrase, you brought me up. You brought my life up from the pit, O Yahweh, my God. If you woke up from a nightmare and you were in a worse nightmare, you don't have a sigh of relief. The whole thing works only if you're not only delivered from something, but you are delivered to something. 
And here's what Jonah reflected upon and realized in thinking about that deliverance. He first said it was divine. Notice the phrase, but you, but you. You know what Jonah was? He was helpless. He was hapless. He was hopeless. And when you're like that, there's no way you can save yourself. It's so obvious. When you're drowning and your whole body's fighting, but it's just giving way, and you know you're giving out, and there's no hope for you, you're tied up and bound, and you're completely lost, you don't know up from down, you want to know what's so clear then? It's only God who saves you. It's his power. It's his presence. It's his salvation. You know, Jonah thought the bars of the earth, they have enclosed around me, locking me in like a prison. And he thought this, it's over. You know what but God says? It means this, not yet. It's only what God can do. And you want to know, on the one hand, the brilliance of salvation. The brilliance of salvation is that God has done it so he gets all the credit and all the glory. And it's so clear. But you want to know what that also means? That's the amazingness of salvation. Salvation is the accomplishment of what is humanly impossible. Brothers and sisters, sometimes we've lost the joy of salvation because we think it's automatic. Because this is the way it should be. This is how we treat a lot of Bible narratives. We just are like, Moses, what's your problem? Just start waving your arms, part the sea. Come on, Peter, why are you asking dumb questions? Just ask, you know Jesus is going to feed the 5,000. They didn't know any of that. It's not automatic. And we treat salvation as if we're entitled to it. And it's just an easy thing. It's impossible. And what we must realize and what we must understand true salvation is, just like Jonah said here, it has to be divine. Because that's what it's going to take to execute this. Because it's impossible. God just did the impossible for me. Don't you understand how amazing that is when God does the impossible? It's not just divine, it's dynamic. It's dynamic. Brought up. You know what's fascinating about this verb is that it's most commonly used for when God brought up Israel from the land of Egypt. That's deliverance. That's invasive, dedicated deliverance. To bring somebody up means you have to go down to their level and deal with the issues that they're facing and overcome them and then deliver them not only from something but to something. That's what God did here for Jonah. His presence was with him the whole time, broke through death, broke through the reeds that had bound him, broke through all that was enshackling him and delivered him by appointing to him a a big, great fish that would save him. That's dynamic. If you ever wonder how much God loves you, if you want to marvel in the love of God, here's what God says. I'll even kill death for you. I'll even go to death and beyond to save you because I'm committed to you. Marriage, the highest human love, is till death do us what? Part. God says, my love is beyond that because death will never do us part. And if it means this, I have to kill my own son to save your soul, I'll do it. I'll do it. You know what the resurrection shows? Nothing is off the table for those whom God has loved. God has offered everything up. He has offered the ultimate, most exhaustive sacrifice that can exist. That's what the resurrection proves. That's how great God loves his own. And speaking of it, it's not just divine, it's not just dynamic, it's undeserved. Notice that Jonah says, you brought up my life. Not just me, but my life. Why? Because when God delivered Jonah from something, he delivered Jonah to something. And what did he give Jonah back? Not just his body, but his what? His life. His life, everything in life. In fact, sometimes we even talk about it. When people have had a near-death experience, what do they say? I have a new lease on life. That's what Jonah had. That's what Jonah had, and it's a reminder of the profundity of what he realized that God did for him in that moment. He didn't just give him his body back. He didn't just give him physical existence back. He gave him back what? Life. I love the Christian life. 
Yes, there are trials. Yes, there are difficulties. But walking with Christ and being with believers and seeing everything through that lens and understanding providence and understanding the great love of God and knowing that all things work out for good and knowing where we're heading and knowing and daily experiencing all the sovereignty and all the blessings that there are therein promised by the scripture which provides such clarity. I love the Christian life. Know this. You and I, we should have never tasted of it at all. At all. All you should have ever known is that you were choking and gasping for air under the weight of your own condemnation. You should have never enjoyed a flower. You should have never enjoyed a tree. You should have never laughed. You should have never smiled. You should have never had any of those things at all. But you do. Because of the grace of the resurrection. That you would have life and life abundantly. That's what you have. And that's what Jonah realized. He didn't just give me back my body. He gave me back a life, a new lease on life. Never take the Christian life for granted. And all of this solidifies and codifies around this, that this moment, this moment Jonah had was not just divine, not just dynamic, not just undeserved. It was designed. Notice what Jonah says in the, toward the end of verse 6. He says, you brought my life out from the pit. Everyone see that phrase, from the pit. That's actually a quote from Psalm 16. If you remember Psalm 16, it's actually a prophecy of the resurrection quoted in Acts numerous times. If you remember Psalm 16, it's not just a prophecy about the resurrection quoted in Acts. It's a prophecy of the Messiah's resurrection that's quoted in Acts. And Jonah uses it here. Why is it that we're using and we're making the analogy between Jonah's near-death experience and the immense contrast of eternal death and resurrection? Why is it that we are saying that this represents and connected with the resurrection? Why is it that in the New Testament, even Jesus says there's the sign of Jonah and he makes the analogy between Jonah's experience three days and his own resurrection. Why is that? Because Jonah told us so right here. He made it clear. He said this, look, I nearly died. I should have been dead. And what God did in that moment is he opened my eyes to this truth that I shouldn't just have died physically, I should have died eternally. I should have had this experience that I had for five seconds or whatever for forever. But because of what Christ will do for me, what was prophesied of him and what he secured for me, I'm alive. This isn't just about my near-death experience. God used it as an object lesson to teach him about eternity and about the glory of the resurrection. And Jonah knew that, so he wrote it down here. I'm not just talking about Psalm 18 or Psalm 69 or all these other Psalms that talk about near-death experience. I'm talking about Psalm 16, the prophecy of the resurrection, because I'm talking about how all this represents and is analogous and teaches me about that resurrection. That's what Jonah said said here. And brothers and sisters then, what we have to understand is you and I, we should be dead. We should have had an eternity like Jonah experienced in five seconds. That was the closest any believer gets to really death. And it's not even really that close. It's just a taste of it, both in temporariness as well as intensity for sure. But it's enough to remind us, you and I, we should be dead. We should never smile. We should never have had joy. We should have never experienced anything. We should have never had an ounce of blessing in our life. We should have never breathed. We should have never had anything but struggle and toil and heartache and confusion and fear and dread. And that should have been, in your mind, there's no other option. There's no other alternative. There is no other escape from that. That's just the way it's going to be for forever. And then you're alive. You're alive. And I'm alive. And we breathe. And here's what God gave us. He did the impossible for us. Here's what God gave us. He gave you life. He gave you life back, a life that you should never take for granted. Here's what God gave you. He gave you a love that sacrificed everything to have you and stopped at nothing to get you back. That's what he gave you. And when you have something like that, you know that your deliverance isn't just dynamic. It isn't just divine. It isn't just undeserved. It's not just designed. You know what it is? It's the most delightful. Here's what Jonah cries out in the belly of the fish and meditating on what God had just done for him and all that it means. He says this phrase, oh, Yahweh, my God. Yahweh, my God. You know what Jonah at this moment realized? 
he realized everything about Yahweh and his name is true. Yahweh is transcendent. I am who I am. God is his own definition. He is eternal. He is infinite. He is independent. He is not created. He is who he is. But he gave that personal name to his people because all that God is, is all for you and me, for those whom he has a covenant relationship with. And you know what the resurrection proved? That that's true. And Jonah said, now I know your Yahweh. Now I know how powerful, how amazing, how majestic, how transcendent you are, and that you are the covenant-keeping God because of what you have done for me. He realized Yahweh is who he says he is, but it's more than that. It's not just that he had this theological revelation of the richness of God in that sense. It is that he had a relationship with this God. Notice the final phrase. He doesn't just say, you are Yahweh God. He says, you are Yahweh my God. You know, Jonah talked about God all the time. Even in Jonah 1, the sailors ask, Who, who's your God? He says, Yahweh. Sailors feared God more than Jonah at that point, though. Jonah never calls God his God, my God, until after he goes into the fish. Before, he just talked about God. Here, he loves God. Brothers and sisters, we need to stop just talking about God. You need to make sure he's your God. And one day, the resurrection, and when we are all raised, and when we look back and we realize what we've escaped from in full, the desperation of death, and we look at what our Savior has done and how much he has loved us and how much was involved to sacrifice and to give and to invest and how hard it was and that we didn't deserve any of it. And what we have now with eternal blessings forever and ever solidified in unceasing joy, we will look at our God and say, Lord, I don't, I'm not sure why you did all that for me. I'm not sure, but I'm so thankful I'm so thankful. Thank you. I, I should have been dead. That should have been me. But I'm alive. And all these other people here too, including even some of my friends and family, they're here because of you. Thank you. You are Yahweh. You are exactly who you said you are. I know that now because everything about you has been used for everything for me. I know you are Yahweh, and you're not just Yahweh, you are Yahweh, my God. This is the cry of the redeemed, because this is the cry of all those who know this kind of grace, that you should have died, but you're alive, because of the Son of God who came to save us, whom God raised from the pit before us so that we would be conformed to his resurrection. Brothers and sisters, you want to understand the resurrection? You should have died, but you're alive. So let's stop speaking about God, just about God, and make sure that he is Yahweh, my God. Shall we pray? Our God and Father, we should have died. We know we should have perished. And bring us to those moments and help us to recall those moments where we just knew for certain and we knew with full devastating effect all that we deserved. And we knew we were doomed and yet we made it to the other side. That's by your providence in this world. And make us understand from that, just like Jonah did, that there's something far greater that we were delivered from. And may the wonder of that and the joy of that make us prize the resurrection and prize your son and prize his love for us and that he is Yahweh and all that that means more than we ever have done before. And may it be that we join with all the saints, with all our heart, to cry out, Yahweh, my God. In your name we pray. Amen.